Hey, what's up? Thanks for listening and watching the Don't Read a Bible Verse podcast. Might sound a bit strange, but the purpose of this podcast is to emphasize the totality of God's Word, the context of God's Word. We do not need to treat the Bible as a bullet point list where we read one verse here, one verse there, one verse everywhere. But instead, we need to read the verses before and after any particular verse that we're studying so that we can understand the author's original intended meaning. I'm the host of the Don't Read a Bible Verse podcast. My name is Aaron Dodson, if you don't know me, and I serve with the Washington Avenue Church of Christ in Jonesboro, Arkansas. This podcast is brought to you by the congregation here at Washington Avenue. It's a work of the congregation. And back several weeks ago, I came online and said, I'm going to start doing this, and I didn't, and now I'm back, and uh, life events and other things going on. But as I am able, on Wednesday afternoons, I'm going to do a, a somewhat brief uh, podcast that will be uploaded later on my uh, Podbean channel that the church uh, hosts as well. So you can listen to the audio format of this later or share it with someone. It will be uploaded later. The study for this afternoon, just maybe about 20 minutes, is going to be an introduction to Matthew chapter 24. If you have your Bible, if you're able to open God's Word, look with me at Matthew chapter 24, and we will begin considering this chapter in a moment because this is a chapter of Scripture that cannot uh, be misunderstood and it does not need to be overlooked. And as you uh, locate Matthew chapter 24, then I'm going to uh, do a few things here on my end where I can uh, see what I'm doing. Yeah, I notice here in my stream, I'm going to retitle my stream as Introduction to Matthew 24. And I hope you are turning there if you're able. Matthew chapter 24. Hopefully this will will work for me. All right. All right. So are you there yet? Matthew chapter 24. You've heard it before, right? Um, I don't, I'm not sure what's going on here. Hang on just a moment. I am sorry for the delay. Trying to back back out and continue my live stream. Thank you. It's working. All right. Thanks for those that are watching live. If you will take a second and just share this, click the share bus button. It won't cost you anything financially to do that. Matthew chapter 24 is the uh, podcast subject today. You've heard it before, haven't you? When you hear of wars and rumors of wars and, oh, you know what's going on with the Palestinians, Hamas and Israel and all these things. These are signs of the end of time, Right? Right? wrong. Look with me at Matthew chapter 24, and look with me at verse 6. Here is a passage that I hear often used out of context, and that's why I titled this podcast. I retitled it, rebranded it, Don't Read a Bible Verse. Instead, read the ones before it and after it. Matthew 24, verse 6, Jesus said, "...and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars." See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places, etc. And people today, modern day preachers of various denominations, will point to Matthew 24 and say, See, that's talking about China and Russia and Jerusalem and Judea and even Hamas the Palestinians, and modern-day Israel. Wars and rumors of wars. Folks, that conclusion is based out of context, and we need to go back to the Scripture and the Scripture alone to see what uh, Jesus was talking about. Before we actually get into the text of Matthew 24, Lord willing, in future episodes to come, I want you to consider with me chapter 21 through 23. Won't be able to read many passages from this, but as I turn in my uh, copy of God's Word, I hope that you will too. 
Matthew 21 details the triumphant entry of Jesus. Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem on the last week of his life, presumably, many commentators believe, on Sunday. And that's what it looks like to me from my study. Jesus enters the city after having prepared uh, his disciples to help him in coming into the city and being hailed as the rightful king, as he was and is. And then Jesus, when he enters the city, does a very bold thing. He comes in and he cleanses the temple. This is Matthew 21, verses 21 through 17, a very needed thing that he did and a very bold thing that he did because the religious leaders, no doubt, were already set against him. And I can only imagine this move only helped to hasten the anger in the hearts of the religious leaders against him because they were already against him. And this was one of the last things, I think, that and the resurrection of uh, Lazarus that helped to be the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will, that helped to hasten Jesus' death. All part of God's scheme, no doubt. Jesus accused the religious leaders of his time of using the house of God that was supposed to be a house of prayer, a den of thieves, a place to hide their wickedness and to profess outwardly that they were God's people. And Jesus, again, he, he exposes that. Jesus discusses uh, the fact that the city was like a withered fig tree that did not produce the fruit that it was supposed to. And he's speaking, again, he's in Jerusalem. He's speaking of Jerusalem and its inhabitants as a whole. No doubt there were some and many who were following Jesus. We know after the resurrection of Jesus, there were only about 120 disciples. So the, the crowds at large, those large crowds, I should say, most of them uh, were just people that were following. They weren't spiritually following Jesus Christ. Authority is questioned. Remember Matthew 21, 23 and following, he gives the parable of the vine dresser and that pertains to uh, how he would be rejected and how in being rejected, God would take the kingdom away from these unbelieving Jews and give it to a nation that would bear the fruits of it. Matthew 21, 43. He gives the parable of the wedding feast. And this, again, regarding his people and the group of people, the, the large group of people in his time that rejected him and how people had to be prepared in order to be right with God and to enter the heavenly kingdom on the final day. Matthew 22, verse 15 and following, uh, three questions that were asked carefully crafted questions, I might add, to trip Jesus up. This is the last week of his life. The momentum is going forward, and things are progressing, and the religious leaders are very quickly growing intolerable. Hey, thank you so much to those that are watching. Uh, let me pull up my chat, my comments, so I can see you a little better. Uh, Glenna Goss and uh, also... Inez Parton, thank you so much, y'all, for watching and, and all the others that are watching as well. Feel free to comment if you want. The show is not, uh, this episode, this podcast is not based around the comments, but uh, I may mention them at the, at the end if I have time. But thank you so much for watching. Matthew chapter 22, as that chapter, as we call it, comes to a close. Jesus asked this question that after he asked this question, they didn't dare question him anymore. When Jesus said, what do you think about the Christ, the Messiah? Whose son is he? And they said, the son of David. And he said, well, how then does David in the spirit call him, Messiah, Lord? The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? Well, the conclusion of this is the Messiah had to become a man. He became a human being, the son of God. And it was him, the one who was speaking to them. Each of those three carefully crafted questions to trip Jesus up, Jesus, of course, the master teacher, knowing all things, answered, and by asking his question at the end, it required them to make a conclusion about him that they didn't like, and it silenced them. Matthew 23, I'm, probably you're familiar with this. You remember Matthew 23, where Jesus then speaks to the multitudes and to the disciples this long sermon, I would call it, 
of, of condemnation upon the religious leaders. I, I'm not going to, to read all of it. I, I don't think that I have time. I, I wish I did. But, but for time's sake, just, just look with me as I go over the text very quickly as we build up to future episodes to come about the context of Matthew 24 and the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of time and those things. Matthew 23, 2, Jesus said to the, to the multitudes and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers, but all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best seats at the feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, teacher, teacher, rabbi, rabbi. Now, I'm going to pause there for time's sake. Jesus is addressing the religious system of his day, the religious leaders. But he's doing this to his disciples and to the, the crowds, the multitudes that were gathered around him uh, in this last week of his life. And beginning with verse uh, 13, there are, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, at least five, six, seven, eight, eight or more woes, nine, I see at least nine, and I may have counted that wrong, at least nine times Jesus uses the words, woe to you, which woe was a word of warning and condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And he tells them why he's giving them this woe or these woes, these warnings. They are stark, bold, and, and, and condemning statements about their ungodly behavior and attitudes. So he's speaking of the religious leaders in his day. Look with me at verse 30, verse 30. The people of Jesus' day, especially the religious leaders, they thought that if they had lived in the days of their fathers, they wouldn't have been partakers in persecuting the prophets. Jesus said, yeah, but you adorn the monuments of those that killed them. Verse 31, therefore you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Look at verse 32. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Verse 36. I hope you have your Bible open or your digital Bible, whichever it is, and you're looking at the text of God's Word. Assuredly, I say to you, this is Matthew 23, 36. All these things will come upon this generation. So Jesus has made a number of statements about how evil, his, the religious leaders were, he, one of the words that he uses over and over is hypocrite. The idea of hypocrite uh, was associated with, with the plays, you know, of that time. A person who played a part, who acted a part. And Jesus' religious leaders were just acting to be God's people. They weren't actually being God's people as they were supposed to be. They were playing they were acting. They, were, they, 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 they put on a face. And they were teaching, as Jesus often exposed, their traditions. And they held the tradi Matthew 15, they held the traditions to the level of Scripture, even over Scripture on occasions. So Jesus, again, condemns them on a number of levels here that they would prevent people from coming in the kingdom that were trying to come in, Matthew 23, 13. That they took advantage of those who couldn't help themselves, Matthew 23, 14. 
that they would travel land and sea to win a convert, a proselyte. But when they would win that person over, they were twice as much a son of hell as they were. Wow, what a condemnation. What does that mean? They were corrupt, and their converts were corrupt because they were the ones that were following these corrupt leaders. Jesus calls them blind guides, verse 16. Fools and blind, verse 17 and 19. Fools, blind. You know, I wonder how many people that um, think about Jesus recall or keep in mind that Jesus called those who played religion and who professed to be God's people yet hurt God's people and made a mockery of God's true religion. I wonder how often people keep in mind that Jesus called them out. He called them blind guides. He called them fools and blind twice. He called them hypocrites many times in this text. Well, obviously, that's what they needed to hear. Jesus was giving them the truth that they needed to hear. Now, look with me at Matthew 23, verse 36 again. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. So Jesus begins to give what I would say us today as we read in the written word. He has given the context clues. We can know to whom he was speaking, about whom he was speaking, and when the things he spoke of would come to pass. He said that these things of condemnation would come upon that generation. Let's continue. Matthew 23, verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. What house? The house of Judah. The house of the nation, including the destruction of the temple. Verse 39, For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I think that has to do with Jesus uh, coming into the city and then uh, the destruction of the city and those seeking God and Christ uh, before and even after that time. Chapter 24, verse 1. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. So we know that Jesus was in the temple compound when he was preaching these things. And his disciples come to him, and they show him the buildings of the temple. I can just see uh, as they're walking out and they're headed toward uh, Mount uh, of Olives, there, uh, Matthew, uh, excuse me, Mark 13, 1, then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and of what buildings are here. And I'm glancing over quickly uh, to Luke's account because I can't recall the exact wording that he uses there. Let me see if I can put my finger on it. Matthew uh, 21, verse 7. I'm sorry, Luke 21, verse 7. So they asked him, no, 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 Luke 21, verse 5. I got it. Luke 21, 5. Then as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and donations. He said, these things which you see, the days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. That's from Luke's account. Basically the same wording in Matthew's account, Matthew 24, 2. Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, the word assuredly or verily, verily, the words mean amen, amen. That means from the original language, the Greek language, this is so. I, I, it's a solemn declaration. It's like saying, I solemnly swear, I solemnly declare to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And the disciples are somewhat puzzled, no doubt, because their entire religious and social life circles and or go, goes up to, it, it surrounds the temple, I should say, depends on, under Judaism, the temple. And so now as Jesus said on the Mount of Olives, verse 3, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? 
And that's where I'm going to stop this podcast, hoping that at least someone who's watching this will continue to look for future installments. I started this way. Matthew 24, verse 6, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. I hear people today, maybe you have too, who will quote that passage or read that passage, and they'll say, see, there's wars, rumors of wars. There's wars going on in Israel today, wars in Russia, wars in China. These are the signs of the times. I hear that often. I hear it often. But Jesus was speaking in the first century to first century people about a first century event. And we follow that first century event from Matthew 23 all the way through Matthew 24, at least verse 35. Okay? Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 34, I solemnly declare to you this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Dear listener, dear watcher, Matthew 24, verses 1 through 34, is not about Hamas. It's not about Israel today. It's not about China today. It's not about Russia today. Dear viewer, dear, dear listener, please, let's don't read a Bible verse, but the ones before it and the ones after it. Otherwise, we're not going to get the original contextual meaning that was intended by the original inspired of God writer. So what is it? Well, Jesus discusses some things that he says all of them, Matthew 24, 34, all of those things would come to pass in that generation. That was in the first century, folks. Not 2024. Not future to our time. Long before our time. From Matthew 24, and you can even back up before, I've, I've handled that. Matthew 23, 37, through Matthew 24, verse 34. Everything, Jesus said, would come to pass in that generation. So be on the lookout, be aware, use Scripture, but don't just use it, study it, and know the context. And when you see TV preachers or the preacher where you are, or your church or your family member's church or your cousin or mother or brother or sister's preacher or whoever, speaking from Matthew 24, verses 1 through 34, saying that those are things that are happening now or about to happen or are yet future, you dig back into Matthew 23 and 24 like we just did and look at the key words that are used. Notice to whom Jesus is speaking and in what generation he's speaking and how he says, Matthew 24, 34, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. So everything that Jesus discussed was going to take place in that generation. Folks, it is with love for the truth that I say what I'm about to say. When you hear someone professing to be a preacher of the gospel and they turn to these passages and they say that these are things that are either happening now or about to happen or will happen one day, that person is wrong. And it's not because I said so. It's because we just read Jesus' words that say so. The words of Jesus are the truth, not me and not whoever says that these things are yet future, the words of Jesus. Again, the title of the podcast, don't read a Bible verse. Read the ones before it and read the ones after it to get the author's original intended meaning. There is only one true accurate meaning or interpretation, I should say, to any verse or any section of Scripture. And it's not what I say. It's not what the most popular TV preacher says. It's whatever the original author intended. And that is decided and determined by a person today based on context. So don't read a verse of Scripture. Read the ones before it 
and the ones after it. Thank you so much for watching this podcast. Thank you, Miss uh, Glenna Goss. Thank you. She said, amen. Thank you so much for watching. This will be uploaded to the uh, my Pod, Podbean channel. And if I can remember, I'll go back and put a link on this video where you can follow that if you'd like to listen to this audio later or share the audio with others. And I intend to do a video uh, once a week. And, um, and then other times there'll be audio uploaded in addition to this one to the podcast channel that I've been doing, Podbean channel, I should say, for several years now uh, on behalf of of my good brethren here. And again, I want to mention this podcast is brought to you by the Washington Avenue Church of Christ. And if you're in Jonesboro, Arkansas, you're invited to come and study God's Word with us. We have Bible studies for all ages, Bible classes for all ages on Sundays at 9 a.m. and on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. That's tonight. You're invited 7 o'clock tonight, we meet at 2001 West Washington Avenue here in Jonesboro, Arkansas, 72401. We hope to see you there and study God's Word with us. God bless, and I will.